Hello. This presentation is going to be about three-phase flow and pores media. It's going to be about oil layers and the effect of wettability. In the previous presentation, I showed how oil spreads on water, so it can spread as a film between water and a gas, or air in this case. But what does it mean in terms of a porous medium? So what we're going to do very shortly is show a three-dimensional X-ray image inside a piece of rock. In fact, exactly this, this rock, uh, which is a ketum, it's a limestone, mainly composed of calcite. Inside this rock, what do we see? What does it mean for recovery? We're also going to look at cases where the rock has been in contact with crude oil and it's rendered some of the surfaces oily or oil wet. Okay, so to do that, let's uh, look at uh, some pictures here. So here we show two pictures. One on the left is that X-ray image, okay? Really looking inside a piece of rock, zooming in now to the sub-millimeter scale. And what we have here is a, is a system where we had a rock that was initially full of water, then oil moved in, and then we injected gas. So GI there uh, indicates gas injection. Okay, so we've got gas injection here. So the gas is shown in red, and the gas tends to enter the large pores. It doesn't have any affinity for the solid surface, so it tries to stay away from the surfaces in the large pores. The water, it's a water wet rock, it's actually a clean rock, Okay, so the water is in the nooks and crannies of the pore space. It likes the surface. The oil spreads between the water and the gas, but it doesn't just spread. In fact, it forms not a molecular film, but what I call a layer. The molecular film is nanometers in thickness. This layer, in this particular example, is a few tens of microns across and is sufficiently thick to allow significant fluid flow. So the oil can now flow, the oil can be connected and be recovered. So what's shown on the right are some schematics of exactly this, showing a single corner in the pore space, again, a few microns across. But if the water here is retained in the corners, the gas goes into the big pores, and then there's this layer of oil in between, the oil has accumulated in this layer. And in fact, we can see this even if we have what we show here where this bold surface is where oil has moved in and some surface active components of the oil have rendered that surface more oil wet. Now the water bulges into the oil, the gas is still non-wetting to the oil phase, so we still get an oil layer. And in fact, the key thing here now is what we show on the bottom, theta G oil, is the contact angle between the gas and the oil. And if we have a spreading system, we would normally assume that that contact angle is really very low. Okay, so we've got a small contact angle between the gas and the oil. But what about the other contact angles? So what we're going to show here is a very important relationship in uh, three-phase flow called the Bartel-Osterhoff relationship. And it comes, it's a generalization of the Young equation. So what's shown here on the right-hand side are the Young equations on a solid surface where we have two pairs of fluids, so oil and water. Then the Young equation shown there on the... the uh, left that equation 8.4 is uh, from my book, okay, is the interfacial tension between the oil and the solid, sigma OS is sigma WS plus sigma or W cos theta oil water. So it's a horizontal force balance because we've got a solid surface, the vertical force balance um, is dealt with by the, the, the solid, okay? But of course we can have gas and water together and we can have gas and oil. So we can actually write three Young-like equations. So we do that now, doesn't seem to be terribly satisfactory because now we've got three contact angles between oil and water, between gas and oil, and maybe in most systems, you know, that, that contact angle is close to zero, and between gas and water. So it seems pretty complicated. And six interfacial tensions, right? The three with the surface and then the uh, interfacial tensions between the two fluids. So mm, that's a bit complex, but it turns out there's a nice relationship between the fluid-fluid interfacial tensions and contact angles, which shown sort of geometrically at the bottom um, here, but actually can be seen quite easily. What um, we've done here is we see here, we take this expression, 8.5, and we take away 8.6. And what we do when we do this is we're going to eliminate the gas-solid uh, interfacial tension because that's something that we can't readily measure. So what we have is this water-solid plus this gas water cos theta gas water and then what we have here so we got a new expression 
and we've got rid of the gas solid in hypertension. And now what we do is we're going to then look at this plus this, and we're going to cancel things out. So if we add these two together, we see that the oil solid cancels out here, the water solid cancels out here, they're on other sides of the equation. And in fact, all the solid interfacial tensions disappear, and we're left with, well, what are we left with? Okay, we're left with the gas water, sigma gas water cos theta gas water is sigma oil W cos theta oil W plus sigma gas oil cos theta gas oil. This is rather a beautiful relationship. It's the bottle, bottle Osterhoff relation. It shows, in fact, that the contact angles and interfacial tensions in free phase flow are not independent. The interfacial tensions are interfacial energies. They are what they are. They are measured. So those are measured quantities. But then, if we know the contact angle between oil and water, which is really determined by the interaction of the oil and the water on the solid surface, so that's what we normally consider as wettability, plus the gas oil, which is related to spreading, and that gas oil interfacial tension, as I said, is often close to zero, then that specifies the gas water as a, uh, contact angle. So the gas water contact angle okay, is not independent. We can't have any wettability between gas and water if we know the properties of the oil water and the gas oil system. So let's see what that implies. Okay, so what it implies is the following. Let's take, first of all, a simple system, which is water wet. Okay, so the bartel osterhoff relationship is shown there on the top. If we have a water wet system, the oil water contact angle is close to zero, the cosine is close to one. Okay, so, and again, we take a spreading uh, system, so the gas oil uh, contact angle is close to zero, the cosine is close to one. So what we have here is simple rearrangement of the equation. Um, the cosines are um, one. And we see that the cosine of gas water interfacial tension is the sum of the two oil water and gas oil divided by the gas water. But actually, if it's a spreading system, what's shown there is the equation for the spreading coefficient, which is the gas water minus the other two. Well, if that's zero, <laughs> then the gas water is equal to the sum of the other two. And so that equation simplifies it, so we just get a one here. So in fact, if it's strongly water wet in the presence of oil, it's strongly water wet in the presence of gas. And that sort of makes sense because it's water wet with oil and gas is non-wetting to oil, well then it's gonna be water wet in the presence of gas. So that's, that's sort of intuitively obvious. And now let's take another case. And that's really rather more interesting. Let's take an oil wet case. So if it's strongly oil wet, we have a surface that's been coated with oil. The contact angle between oil and water is greater than 90 degrees. If it's 180 degrees, which is the most extreme, that cosine will be minus one. So now let's look at this bottom equation. Cos theta gas water is minus, right? Minus here, minus sigma oil water, plus sigma gas oil. But normally the oil water interfacial tension is larger than between gas and oil. If it's an ambient condition, it's about 50 millinewtons per meter versus 20 millinewtons per meter. If we go subsurface, where the gas and oil are both hydrocarbon mixtures, the, in, the uh, interfacial tension between gas and oil could be very low, one millinewton per meter or lower. The oil water interfacial tension will be lower, maybe about 20 millinewtons per meter, but still definitely you know, a larger number. So that becomes negative. So now, Gas becomes wetting in the presence of water on an oily surface. Hmm, it's a bit odd. Who see this? Well, actually, you see it in lots of occasions. So what the photograph there, um, is shown a leaf, okay? Now, leaves, you might say, oh, they're, they're, they're water wet, they soak up water. No, no, no. Leaves, to have may have a rough surface they also have stomata they have little holes they want to draw up water from the roots but the holes allow them to take in carbon dioxide release oxygen or take in oxygen when they respire they need actually these holes to exchange gases okay? they need to exchange both oxygen and carbon dioxide how do they do that well if they were water wet they just soak up water no the surface of leaves, you could look at them yourself in your garden, 
right? They tend to be quite waxy, they're quite oily. They're in fact, oil wet. And now when you have water on that surface as shown there on the left, the water forms a bead on an oily surface. But just a moment, that's a solid surface, okay? between gas and water, and the water is non-wetting. The gas actually is more wetting. In fact, the gas wants to be on the surface. You get this exactly the same if you have a nice polished tabletop or something that's rather plasticky surface, or indeed a rain jacket that's plastic. Okay, there it's an oil wet surface, an oily surface, and the water runs off. You might say, yeah, but is it really oil wet? Yes, because the picture you show here on the right is the same leaf. Well, what I've done is I've poured on olive oil. In fact, the oil soaks into the leaf. Okay, you see this, it spreads out, it soaks in, you see it sort of run off here and uh, actually stained uh, the dry leaf behind. So in fact, it is an oil wet surface, this leaf, the oil just spreads out. Okay, the oil likes the surface, but the water does not. Now you might say, well, what's that uh, got to do with, with anything? Well, let's give some examples of porous media. Here I've got a uh, children's book. Um, it looks a bit backwards here, so if you can read backwards, okay, but it says ducks don't get wet. Okay, why don't ducks get wet? So here's some nice pictures of ducks preening their feathers and staying dry. Why is that? Well, ducks feathers are a porous medium. Right? Okay, so they're very fluffy, okay, and they keep sort of fluffing them up. They're in water. What they need to do is they need to keep feathers inside dry because then they're full of air and air insulates the duck. It stops the duck getting cold when they're on cold water. But how do they do this? Because water just gets so in. Mm -hmm. They have special gland and they keep preening and they keep the feathers oily. So now they have an oil wet surface. That means that actually gas is wetting in the presence of water. Gas has an affinity for the surface that is greater than that of water. So the water doesn't go in. In fact, you need a positive pressure to push the water into the feathers. So the ducks, as long as they keep their, their feathers nicely aerated, sitting um, in the pond, they're not going to get wet. In fact, the water, it's a water repellent surface. And keeping a porous medium actually helps do that. So for instance, when their, their oil spills on the ocean and seabirds uh, go onto the spill, obviously because their feathers are oil wet, they soak in a lot of this oil. All you have to do there to rescue the birds is actually just wipe off as much oil as possible. What you mustn't do is clean the bird, get some soap, sort of get them nice and clean, get rid of that uh, nasty crude oil, you made the feathers water wet. And in fact, then the bird tends to die of hypothermia. So you might say, okay, well, that's interesting. It tells about ducks. Um, do we have other examples? Well, of course we do. You know, why do sheep stay dry? They've got a sort of woolly coat, but it's oily. Okay. When we get the wool and make our own jumpers, we keep them clean and they're water wet and they're gonna soak in the water in the rain. So then we have to have something, an overcoat, and normally that will have a waxy or a plasticky surface to be water wet. But what about rocks? What does it mean in terms of rocks? Well, what it means in terms of rocks is, if I've got a rock that's full of oil and I inject gas, the gas is non-wetting in the presence of oil, goes through the big pores, actually moves rapidly through the rock uh, breaks through at a production well rapid, quickly, and so we leave, you know, potentially quite a lot of the oil behind. That's not favourable. But if there's oil and water both present, actually, when there's water, the gas is not necessarily non-wetting. So it's competing with the water for the bigger pore spaces, and actually is less well connected. It doesn't tend to hog the fast flow pathway so much. So it has a huge impact on the behaviour of fluid flow, depending on how much water is present relative to oil. So it does have consequences in three-phase flow of course media, but it's a very simple, nice exercise. So uh, if you want to, to read more, you can find out about ducks, but it has applications clearly in geological porous media applications. So I'll end there. Thank you very much.